Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Pastor John here with the Bible Baptist Church for our Wednesday night online Bible study. I'll give you all a minute to hop on. Making sure I got my Wi-Fi on so it's nice and clear. All right, everybody, I'll let you, let you log on. Hope everybody's having a great day so far. And we'll give you guys just a minute here. Get this all set. Wednesday night, June 3rd, 2020. Great to see you. Starting to see some comments pouring in. Great to see Ryan Wade, my dear Christina Jenkins, Donna Wade, Sharon MacArthur. Lillian Christensen, good to see you tonight, my friend. Thanks for the comment. Welcome in, Judy Schaefer. Good to see you guys. Glad to be connecting with you. We uh, began in-person worship services at Bible Baptist in Howell this past weekend, May 30th and 31st, and it was so good to see so many of your faces and uh, others of you who were maybe playing it a little safe or waiting a bit, um, or if I just plain missed you at the service, man, I miss all of your faces, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Trust that the Lord uh, is keeping you and that um, you are well. Good to see you tonight. Jeff, Ginny Parker, Brandon Powers, Debbie Hawk, welcome in, everybody. A lot of familiar BBC names and faces here on my screen. It's great to see you guys. We're going to be in Acts chapter 27 tonight, everybody, for a few minutes in the Word tonight. If you guys want to grab your Bibles or uh, your smartphones, whatever you're using, and hop over there to Acts 27. I'm just going to stall here for another moment and let a few more people log on. It's a beautiful summer night here in the state of Michigan. And with all of this quarantine and everybody cooped up in their houses... I would have fully understand it if everybody decided to just go for a walk tonight. Catch this later. But at least uh, about 13 or 14 of you have decided to jump on with us. I'm so glad you have. And uh, if you're out for a walk right now and you watch this at a later time, we love you too. That works. Jan Place, hi. How are you? Good to see you. Thanks for the comment. Welcome in Jill Lockhart. Okay. We're getting a little bit of an audience. I ran in here tonight, everybody, from some duties of my day. Literally got to my house about two minutes before this video began. So uh, maybe like some of you who had a busy day, I'm just trying to reset myself here and uh, turn my head and heart uh, to the Lord's Word with you tonight. I'm sure thankful for the Lord's grace and goodness in my life, just the health and uh, the blessings he's giving, he's given me, and I know you feel the same. I sure hope you do. Uh, our world is in the midst of constant turmoil, isn't it? We've just spent the last 11 weeks or so, 12 weeks, dealing with the coronavirus, and then to have the, uh, the death of George Floyd and all the rioting that's going on. I even saw something... Uh, about a meteor the size of a football stadium that's gonna pass pretty close to Earth here in the next few days. So if it's not one thing, it's the next. Uh, the Lord promised us that in this world we would have trouble and tribulation, but he also promised us that he has overcome the world. I'm so, so thankful that he's given us a hope and a confidence and a faith to live victoriously. Well, let's jump into it, guys. It's 7.05. And uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter number 27. I have missed being with you. We were together a couple Wednesday nights ago. We talked about the new normal, what life will look like post-COVID, not only in a practical sense, but also spiritually, uh, as we seek to really identify and uh, pursue the potential that God has for each and every one of us. Not just settling for life as it comes, but really seeking to be all that we can be uh, for the Lord's glory and also um, for our families and uh, for, our, for our futures as well, personally. Acts 27 tonight. 
Uh, I'm going to treat you all like we're a, like you're a children's Sunday school classroom this morning. Gather around, boys and girls. Uh, we're going we're gonna to share one of the most epic Bible stories to be contained within the pages of Scripture. Those people who mistakenly feel that the Bible is a boring book have obviously never read Acts chapter 27, nor a number of other exciting passages. This is a thrilling tale, if you will. Uh, Acts chapter 27. We pick up the narrative here. It's about the year A.D. 57, 57 years after Christ's coming and resurrection back to heaven. And the Apostle Paul has spent the past five years or so evangelizing out on missionary journeys. And he's been sharing the gospel through Asia Minor and what is now modern day Greece. And he's coming near the end of his third missionary journey here in Acts chapter 27. Paul is returning to Jerusalem. And he's doing so against the advice of a host of his Christian brothers who feared that he would be imprisoned. And you say, why would he be imprisoned? We'll get to that in just a minute. Paul, nonetheless, did come back to Jerusalem, and he, nonetheless, was arrested, just as they had feared. And not being satisfied with just simply his incarceration, um, a number of Jews, with the approval of the Sanhedrin there in Jerusalem, actually plotted to kill Paul. And the Roman authorities... Uh, to just to give you a little bit of backstory and context to this tonight, the Roman authorities tipped off Paul's nephew, and Paul was removed to the city of Caesarea, and there he appears before Governor Felix. Felix interrogates Paul and finds him to be innocent. And uh, really, Paul's only charge was that charge of sedition. What is sedition, you might ask? It's conduct or speech inciting people to who have been uh, accused of being rebellious against the authority of the state or the monarchy. And so Paul was preaching the clear gospel message, which ran in the face with a host of traditions, certainly uh, the pagan religion and culture of the Roman Empire. He was a maverick. He was a bright and shining light for the, uh, the truth of the gospel. And I pray that we each can have it said of us as, he said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so Paul is here in, Ces in Caesarea where he spends a couple years, actually. We, sometimes we read through these Bible narratives and just assume that it all happened quickly. And it's interesting how these were real people, too, who had to exercise patience and, and uh, navigate frustrations and delays just as we often do in our lives. And uh, so Paul's in Caesarea here, and uh, again, being tried by Felix, and Felix gets recalled to Rome um, for a number of reasons. And so the Jewish leaders immediately asked this new governor, whose name was Festus, to transfer Paul from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And Paul was actually a Roman citizen, if you know the story of uh, his life and lineage. And he was um, forced to exercise his right to appeal to Caesar in order to avoid the grave danger of going to Jerusalem and perhaps being killed. These things that you don't often know when you're just reading the story. Paul was going through a real difficulty. And so he appeared before King Herod, uh, Agrippa II. And Agrippa and Festus both agreed that Paul wasn't guilty of any crime. Uh, and so they are going to... Um, agreed to his appeal to go before Caesar. And so basically Paul is going to be shipped off to Rome to receive his trial. That's where we pick up the story in Acts chapter number 27. We're about AD 59 now is the year. And Paul is leaving for Rome and he's going to go with a number of other prisoners, actually on the ship of prisoners. There's about 276 other prisoners, the Bible tells us, on this ship. Well, actually, prisoners and guards all together, about 276 souls. In verse 1 of Acts 27, it was determined that we should sail into Italy. So they, they set their course for their destination there for Rome and Italy. 
And there's, I want to go through this entire chapter, so we're not going to have a chance to read verses 1 through 40. I just want to kind of quickly jump through it and then get to the application for each of us tonight. But as they set out on this journey, they came into a few different ports. They came to Lycia, and they switched ships there and uh, got onto another boat that was sailing towards Italy. They came into another place, which the Bible refers to as the Fair Havens, and uh, lodged there and, and uh, uh, sought refuge there. And we pick up in verse number nine. Now, when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already past, Paul admonished them. Those of us who live here in Michigan can understand bad sailing weather as we think about the Great Lakes and the gales of November that took down the Edmund Fitzgerald. And there are certain types of the year that are more dangerous to sail than others. And that was the case here on Paul's journey to Rome. Paul admonished them and he said, Sirs, in verse number 10, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage. He knew what time of year it was. He knew what kind of weather there would be. And he was trying to say, guys, for the sake of each of us, maybe we should we should seek refuge here for the winter in the fair havens. Verse 11, nevertheless, the, centur- the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship. He didn't take Paul at his word and they decided to set sail. I apologize. Someone's trying to FaceTime me here. It's my mother-in-law. I have to call you back there, mom. Let's pick up in verse 13. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. Verse 14. But not long after... Sorry, guys. Verse 14. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called... Eurachlodon. You might have heard that story. When I was a young boy growing up in church, I might have misinterpreted that as the name of a dinosaur. But a Eurachlodon is a great storm that comes upon a sea. Verse 15, the ship was caught in the middle of this storm and could not bear up into the wind, so we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat. They had themselves in the middle of a mess. I'm not much of a sailor, but those of you who have maybe sailed a boat or know about all these nautical customs and procedures that uh, implement safety, they were doing their very best to keep this boat right side up in the middle of a great storm. Verse 17, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, they strake sail and so were driven. Verse 18, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day we lightened the ship. Uh, They began to throw things overboard to lighten the ship so that it would not uh, list as deeply in the water. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So they were loosing from the ship the things that were valuable so that they could survive. Verse 20, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was taken away. Now, I've never been marooned on an island. I've never been stranded at sea. Maybe you've watched a Hollywood movie that depicted something like this. But understand, if they couldn't see the stars, they couldn't see the sun, there was there was storm clouds and fog Understand, especially in this day and time, they were guided by the stars as they navigated across the sea at night and they would be able to determine their position by reading the stars. And so they had no clear point of reference. They were literally just floating aimlessly throughout the midst of a great tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon. And I can't help but just tell you, the Bible is written uh, for us for a number of different admonitions and from a number of different perspectives and for a number of different applications. And I think about the context of our lives tonight and how many times we find ourselves, especially over the last 12 weeks, we found ourselves in the midst of a great tempestuous storm and we didn't know which way was up. I talked to a lot of people and they'd say, what day is it? People weren't going to work as regularly. They're working from home and all that. Is it Tuesday? Is it Thursday? I have no idea. Just lost touch with where they were. 
Verse 21, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not loose from Crete. He said, guys, if you'd listened to me, we wouldn't have gotten in the middle of this thing. He follows up in the next verse and says, however, but now I exhort you to be of good cheer. For there shall no loss of any man's life among you, but the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told unto me. How be it, we must be cast upon a certain island. So in the midst of their despair, God appears to Paul and gives him a promise. He says, Paul, even though it looks like all hope will be lost and perhaps even your lives, I'm going to make you the promise that every single one of you is going to make it through this difficult storm. You're going to survive it. Every single one of you, all 276 passengers, is going to make it to land. Now understand the faith that that would have required in that situation. Paul could have looked around and done the math and just said, well, I, I'm having a hard time accepting the promise that you're giving me, God, because I'm looking at my circumstances. And how often do we look at our lives and the circumstances, the formidable things that we face and wonder, God, I know what you said in your word. I know what you speak by your spirit, but I'm just having a hard time choosing faith over fear and choosing to believe your promise rather than accept the fact that I have got myself in a mess here. What an awesome story begins to unfold. We won't take time to read every verse, but over the next couple weeks, 14 days, they were still caught in the middle of this storm, believing the promises of God that they had received from Paul. And at the end of the 14 days, the ver verse number 40 says this, uh, they were, actually, let me go back to verse number 38. Paul encourages them to have some nutrition. They were actually fasting and praying that God would hear them, that they'd survive. And Paul says, you guys need to eat. You need to get your strength because uh, we're going to have to do our part. God has promised that we'd survive, but there's a role for us to fulfill. So they, they eat together and they nourish themselves to, to regain their strength. And then they cast the extra food overboard. No extra weight on the ship. Verse 39, and when it was day, they knew not the land, but they discovered a certain creek with a shore into which they were minded if it were possible to thrust the ship. Verse 40, and when they had taken up anchors, this is the entire message tonight. They committed themselves unto the sea. They committed themselves unto the sea. They loosed the rudder bands, then hoisted up the main sail and made towards shore. Now we skip some verses, but just for time, I'll, I'll quickly paraphrase what they said. They began to take some readings of the depth of the water and it became clear to them that it was getting more shallow. And so they thought certainly land must be approaching, but with land also comes the danger of shoals and reefs and things that could break apart a ship. But they decided to believe that God was in control and they committed themselves unto the sea. Rather than just throwing down the anchors and staying put where they were, maybe until the fog cleared, maybe until uh, they could get a little better perspective and discernment on exactly where they were. This is blind faith at its best. They just said, pull the anchors up, let her drive, we're going to commit ourselves to the sea. Basically, they were saying, we're committing ourselves to the process. Verse 41, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the four parts stuck and remained unmovable. So sure enough, they hit this reef, right? And at this point, you can imagine 267 men on board. It must have been chaos. Verse 42, the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners. Again, these guys were prisoners in transit, right? And so the centurions thought, we've got to kill these guys before they escape, but one of the centurions, verse 43, willing to save Paul, said, hey guys, let's not kill these prisoners, but instead, let's give them all a chance to survive. And what happened is beautiful here. Sure enough, the storm did begin to break the ship apart. 
it was it was caught there on the shoal and you can imagine the waves were rocking it and so everybody abandoned ship and makes for land and verse 44 is just a beautiful verse those that cast themselves into the sea went and got to land in verse 44 and the rest some on boards some on broken pieces of the ship and so it came to pass that they escaped all safely to land understand when they were out there in the midst of that sea the only thing they had protecting them from certain death was that ship they put their faith in the fact that god was going to provide for their safety and he used that ship to do it but there came a point you got to see this everybody when the ship was 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 dashed against the rocks that it began to break apart and the promise of God still rang true even though the ship was broken apart. You understand, some of them grabbed onto broken pieces of the ship that had begun to break away. Some of them, all they had in their hand was a single board, one piece of wooden board, using it as a life preserver, and they used it to float to shore. But no matter what God used to get them safely to land, whether it was the ship in its entirety or if it was one single piece of wood, the promise rings true. They all made it safely to land. Now, I just told you a little story, an awesome Bible story. What's the application? The application in my heart as I, as I meditated upon this the last few days is this. You know, we all have the tendency when we don't understand, we do not have an appreciation for the things that come into our lives. Perhaps it's a storm, it's a difficulty, isn't it true in your heart, as it often is in mine, that I immediately put God on trial? I, I immediately begin to doubt whether or not I'm in this moment, I'm in this situation, I'm in this Eurachlodon by God's design or by God's neglect or perhaps by my own mistakes. We put God on trial and begin to doubt that he has engineered and orchestrated the circumstances of our life when they get tough. We all do it. I'm reminded of what the psalmist said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? We've got to remember that God's plan is so much bigger than we can understand. And it's so important that we don't immediately begin to push God out of the equation and start to engineer our own escape plan, if you will, when we don't understand what's happening. We all have the tendency when we're scared to lose hope, to lose faith, our faith diminishes. We look for that exit strategy. We look for the detour. We look for the shortcut. We look for the escape. You know we do. The simple challenge I have for you tonight is this, everybody. When they made up their mind to commit themselves to the sea, rather than use, we skipped the verse that talked about them lowering the life rafts, which could have been a means of their escape, but instead they cut the rafts loose and they committed themselves to the sea. My challenge to you tonight is this, just as these men did in this storm, as they had to choose to trust God, what God spoke into my heart, into my life when I, when I read this passage was this, when God is doing something in my life that I don't understand, I have to give him a chance. I have to give the circumstances that he's engineering a chance to develop. I have to let it develop. Before I check out, before I, I freak out and lose confidence in everything that I know in my life, I have to look at what God is using. And again, God was using a ship in this story tonight, but I have to look at, and we like metaphors in the church, don't you? And uh, your ship tonight could be a number of different things, but I have to I have to understand that God is using something, and in this story tonight it was the ship, as a means of bringing these men from where they were to where they are. And as you look at your life, what has God used to bring you from where you were to where you are? I have to be willing to let the process run its course. I have to be willing to let it come full circle, if you will. I have to be willing to let it play out. I have to give the process a chance to come to maturity in my life. Sometime God puts me out in deeper water than I can stand in because he wants to grow my faith. But rather than just swim for the shore, 
I will see the miracle. I will receive the blessing if I allow him. Sorry, guys. I don't know what happened there. Intermission. Let's get back on. How many of you have ever watched a movie and you've been a little bored with it in the first few moments, but you decided to just stick in there and near perhaps the middle or the end of the movie, you thought, oh my goodness, this thing started out a little dry. It took some time for the plot to develop, but I am so glad I stuck it out because that was an incredibly awesome movie. It was so entertaining. It was so moving. Wow, I've got tears coming down my eyes. It stirred me. You know what you had to do? You had to be willing to let the plot develop. In this story tonight, they could have done a number of things that possibly could have resulted in their death had they not let God's promises develop in their life. My wife cut some hair and I, I'll often come downstairs in the basement of our house where she's got a little studio and she'll have some, some women whose hair she's doing things with that I can't even begin to describe. She's great at what she does. But um, she'll come up now and then and she'll, like there'll be somebody in our basement having their hair done and Christina will be up and she'll talk to me for a few minutes. I'm like, oh my goodness, did you leave them down there? And she'll say this to me. She'll say, oh, it's okay. They're developing. Like she's got, I don't, again, I don't know how all this works. Um, she's doing cool stuff with ladies' hair. But she has to put some product in their hair and then let it sit for a while for it to do its job. We all have the tendency in our life to be impulsive. Now, we can be decisive and uh, deliberate and walk by faith, but that's different than being impulsive and reactionary and not exercising patience. The Bible talks about letting patience have its perfect work. And let me just tell you, all in my life, all the great I should say all the significant things that the Lord used to change me, to grow me, to help me, to save me at times, are things that took time to develop. I can think back over a number of things that I'm just so thankful I did not screw up because I sought the first escape hatch when God was working in my life. Just wait for it, everybody. Wait for it. Don't jump to conclusions. My challenge tonight is wherever you are, stay with the ship. Stay with the ship. The ship in your life might be your marriage. It might be your occupation. It might be a relationship that you have. It may be your church. It may, it may be your faith in God itself. It could be anything that God is using in your life to get you from where you were you're going to have to contextualize this. You know what's going on in your life. I don't. But it could be anything in your life that God is using to get you from where you were to where you are and where you need to go. That is the ship in your life. Stay with the ship. If you're a child of God, you have proprietary ownership as a family member. You have access to all of the promises of God. And just like in our text here in Acts chapter 27, we each have the promise that it may look confusing, it may look frightening, but we have this promise, everyone. We are all going to make it. Some of us, verse 44, some of us are going to make it on boards. Some of us are going to make it by holding on to broken pieces of the ship. Others of us are going to swim to shore. But if you are a child of God, you have the promise that you are going to be saved and you are going to make it. Now, does that mean your heart is never going to be broken? You're not going to suffer from the consequences of your own bad decision making? I'm not saying that. We have to walk in wisdom. We have to seek the Lord. We have to be, be willing to be honest with ourselves about those things. But what I am saying to you is this. You have your eternity secure. You have a God who loves you, who is out ahead of you fighting your battles, who is orchestrating things uh, on, on behalf of you and your family for tomorrow. You can't even see tomorrow, but he's already there doing a work and you have the promise that you will be saved. And I know some of you are thinking, man, John just keeps bringing these encouraging thoughts every week, but I know there's some of you who are in that place in your life right now where you're just wondering if you're gonna make it. You're wondering if your marriage is gonna make it. You're wondering if you should 
continue to go to the church you go to because you're discouraged because you can't connect with somebody or, 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 or the people you want to connect with and you're just, you don't feel like you're being fed. All these things, you just feel like maybe your, your career has run its course, you're working a dead-end job, you just, you don't know what to do. I'm just telling you, maybe the Lord has brought you to where you are. And let me say, let me assure you, the Lord has brought you to where you are and he's used some things to do it. So rather than just looking for the easy way out, rather than uh, deciding to take the wheel back, take the reins, take charge, what if you just commit yourself to the sea? What if you just say, Lord, there is no way I can make it through this. So I'm just gonna trust. I'm just gonna let you drive. I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to do it your way. I'd like to point this out also that the things that God is using in our life to carry us through our lives, the ships of our lives, that they serve God's purposes. They serve God's purposes. If you've got a ship that's carrying you away from God's purposes, it's not the ship that God wants you to be on. And the rest, some on board, some on broken pieces of the ship, they all escaped safely to land. And let me say this for some of you as we wrap it up tonight. Just because it breaks, just because your health fails, and I know about that, just because you lose your job, just because some relationship that you have cherished for a long time ends just because perhaps tonight you are watching this video somewhere out there in cyberspace and you're holding on to a broken heart. It does not mean that God is done using the ship. You see, God could use it when it was intact and God used it when it broke apart. I fear too many of us have our confidence in our jobs, have our confidence in our bank accounts, have our confidence in our health, have our confidence in things that are not our sustaining grace. They are not the strength of our heart. They are, they are not what God is intending us to rest in. Let me tell you something. If you've got a broken heart, if, you've, if you're recovering from some broken scenario, a divorce, something heartbreaking, you lost someone dear to you. It doesn't mean the ship is sank. Everybody's calling me on this video tonight. I got to remind people not to call me between 7 and 7.30. Let me just tell you this tonight and I'm done. My friends, stay with the ship. Stay with the ship. Stay where God is working. Stay even though it's scary. Hang in there. Let it develop. Take a minute evaluate the way that God has worked, where he has you, how he's got you there. Praise him for the way that he's provided. And then let this process develop. Let it come full circle. Say, Lord, show me what you're doing and then wait for him to show you. See, when, it, when, when I share something like this, it could be vague. It could go right over our heads. Only you know how to implement it in the context of your life. But whether it, whether it be a relationship, your church, whether it be your faith in God, tonight I want to encourage you, don't let go of it. Don't jump into the sea and try to swim your way to shore on your own. Stay with the ship and let it develop. And God is seeing us through this coronavirus outbreak. God will see us through this rioting and all this dissension and uh, r just racial uh, uh, controversy in our nation and all the other things that God is going to bring us to and bring us through. Don't jump. Stay with the ship. I love you guys tonight. I'm so thankful to come to you and share this word. These are not my words. This is God's words. These are for you. And I hope God takes his words tonight and shows you exactly where to apply them. And uh, tomorrow, you... 
can walk more closely with him for having spent a few minutes with me tonight. Let's pray together. Father God, I love you. I thank you for each one who's watching this video and those that will watch it later. Lord God, thank you for providing a means of provision. Thank you for the things that you use in our life to, to transport us from where we were to where we're going. Sometimes we don't understand why and how and when, and that's okay because you do. Lord God, tonight I pray that each person under the sound of my voice, Lord, each person who's coming before the throne with me in prayer at this moment, God would, would just be willing to let the things that you are doing in their life develop. They wouldn't jump ship right in the middle of you doing something great. They wouldn't lose patience and lose hope and mess up all the things that you've been working to bring to pass in their life. Lord, those that have been praying a prayer for a long time for a child or for a healing for someone, Lord, help them not to lose faith tonight. Help them to stay with the ship. Lord, those people who've cried themselves to sleep and Lord, don't know how they're gonna make it through another day, Lord, help them to stay with the ship. Restore unto them the joy of their salvation. Lord, help them to hold tightly to their faith and trust in you. Wherever this hits each one of us, oh God, I pray that, Lord, we leave each other's presence in just a moment more confident that you know exactly what you're doing, more willing to trust you even though we don't understand everything, Lord, and uh, commit ourselves to the sea. Lord, I intend to stay with the ship. Thank you for your mercy and grace in my life. I pray that you continue to lead and guide. I pray for our nation tonight. I pray that you bring peace and healing. I pray for those affected by COVID-19, our first responders, our nurses, doctors. Lord, bring strength and comfort to them. Our world is hurting. It needs you. I pray that we would each be the representative of the gospel that Paul decided to be here in this story, that we could be a part of the change that this world so desperately needs. We love you, Jesus. Amen. My friends, love you guys. Until next time, take care.